welcome to the Tampa Bay History Center. I appreciate those who are here in our live audience, uh, the braving the elements. Uh, those of you watching live at home, hope you're not braving the elements in your house. And anybody who's watching this tape, whatever the weather is like there, hope it's enjoyable for you. Um, welcome to, again, the History Center and to our Florida Conversations Lecture Series. Um, we have a fantastic lecture today, um, but I do want to mention uh, the last one for the season, which will be June 6th, and it is on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, we'll join Fred Hearns, Curator of Black History, Tamara uh, Schwellberger, Tampa Field Office Director of the, for the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and a panel of experts at 630 in Teco Hall talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, before I move forward, I don't want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rodney Kite Powell, and I am the director of the Touch and Map Library here at the Tampa Bay History Center. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce this evening's program. Um, we are joined by two outstanding scholars at USF, Stephen Fernandez and Laura Harrison, who will be talking about the historic streetcar system in Tampa, but also what they're doing uh, in kind of modern terms to really digitize uh, not just the system, but the historic streetcars that still exist today. Uh, I will, again, remind those who are watching at home uh, live, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type them into the uh, little chat uh, box, and some folks uh, who are in the back of the room here will be able to read those questions to me, and we can relay them to the speakers. Uh, any of you all who are here live, um, when we get to the end of the program, you, of course, can also ask your questions. I only ask that you wait for me to get to you with the microphone. That way, your question can be heard by those in the uh, kind of Zoom audience or those who are listening to this recorded. So just hang on a second. Let me get to you with the microphone, then you can ask your question. So with those bits of housekeeping things out of the way, let me introduce our two speakers. Uh, Stephen Fernandez graduated from Oneonta State in New York with a geography degree with a specialization, specialization in cartography. We love cartography here at the History Center. He then attended the University of South Florida for geographical information systems. Eight years later, he was recruited to work on LIDAR scanning projects for USF. He spent 10 years LIDAR scanning historical sites around the world. He scanned and mapped numerous national park historical sites. He trekked and mapped the Mayan ruins in Guatemala, historical launch pads for NASA, and for four years, he modeled and mapped archaeological sens sensitivity for all 175 Florida state parks. He has now switched uh, focus to the urban and regional planning program at USF, where he is an associate instructor and the director of the Smart City Technology Graduate Certificate Program. He continues to use LIDAR to model landscape and threats to Tampa Bay, including storm surge, sea level rise, and other events that can have an impact on the region's assets. During his time at the Urban and Regional Planning Program, he developed a mission where he would use his classes to scan Tampa's most cherished historical sites. It started with New World Brewery, which was part of Tampa's Fire Station Number 2 in Ybor City. Uh, followed by Lee's Grocery in Tampa Heights. And now, each year, he and Dr. Harrison have scanned some of Tampa's most important assets, including Union Station, uh, right at the edge of downtown, the Soto Community Center, the Preserve Casitas in Ybor City, and now Tampa's streetcars and stations in Ybor City. Along with them is Dr. Laura Harrison, who is an associate professor and the founding director of Access 3D Lab at USF. She holds both a PhD and an MA in anthropology from the University of Buffalo and a bachelor's from Ithaca College. As lab director, she oversees research that uses advanced instruments like LIDAR and drones to address real world problems across the sciences and humanities, such as documenting and preserving at risk sites, assessing climate impacts, and engaging the public with cultural heritage, which is what we're doing today. Laura's work has both local and global dimensions. Locally, she has used her digital toolkit to document, interpret, and increase the accessibility of sites like Egmont Key. Union Station, and Fort DeSoto. Globally, she's using 360-degree imaging to promote sustainable tourism in Siberia, excuse me, in Serbia, or Siberia. Maybe we should go there next. Um, 3D scanning uh, to document Roman architecture in Malta and photogram photogrammetry? photogrammetry to reconstruct a Bronze Age site destroyed by a coal mine in Turkey. She regularly collaborates with Stephen Fernandez on several projects, including Tampa's iconic streetcar system. So please welcome both Susan and Laura to the History Center. Make sure 
sure my mic's working. Hello, everybody. So, uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, great to see you all. And thank you for coming through this weather to get here. Um, we did put together some uh, background slides. So thank you so much to Rodney Kite Powell for giving us such a great introduction. Um, the slides here will just show you, which uh, if I can get the next slide, please. Which, oh, I have the next slide, sorry. <laughs> I'm so used to using a mouse, right? Um, so th uh, there's some other information here about what we do. Um, and every year, I think our world expands. Um, I just can't believe some of the things we map. So um, come on. There it is. Um, I also am a, a Hillsborough County Planning Commissioner. Um, so you know, anytime a land use thing comes through. Uh, so I also do real estate. So like I said, um, my colleague, she is definitely the historian and archaeologist here. And you've heard all the places I've been. But the only reason that they let me go is because um, I just map things. So it doesn't matter what needs to be mapped. Um, I'll just go ahead and get to it. So um, I'm going to first start off with some slides of just some historic maps. One that's here. Ah, too, many, too many clicks. All right, so um, unfortunately I can't zoom in on too many things here, but this is a streetcar system map of the city of Tampa and the city of West Tampa at the time in 1920. And um, when I did go to school for cartography, my first class, I did have to use pens and pencils. And so I could not appreciate this map more. Um, but there are just a lot of interesting things on here. That if you look closely, there is no Davis Islands yet. Um, you can see that the seawall is being built. Uh, Harbor Island doesn't really look like what it, it did today. There are no interstates, right? Um, but even more interesting that I thought is at the bottom of the map, uh, some of the interesting things that they thought belonged on the streetcar map is all the cigar factories, a list and location. And each one of them has a number, and they're plotted all throughout this map. On the top is sort of the scheduling and where you can find the stop on these grids on the map. So you can see you know, there's a six and seven, and then letters at the top, so that you can look at that map, figure out what station you want to go on. And this fantastic transportation system was only closed for two and a half hours a day. Uh, it, it started at 4.30 in the morning, and it ended at 2 in the morning. Primarily because we didn't have vehicles, right? This was the only way to get around Tampa and West Tampa and Ybor and the other neighborhoods. So um, just a really interesting map of what it looked like in the past. Our neighborhoods have changed names. Um, see, uh, even roads not developed yet at the time. So just a beautiful map I have a lot of respect for. And then... This one is a little bit of a jump in the future. This is the uh, 1940s, this one's dated. And uh, I started taking a, a really good look at this. And what I started to realize was they were already starting to go to gasoline buses at this point. So even though it says it's a streetcar um, map, uh, some of it was streetcar and some of it was buses. Um, but it also started to get reduced. And shortly thereafter, the streetcar actually was uh, you know, abandoned, and they uh, ended up ripping up all the tracks. And we uh, you know, went 60 or 55 years without streetcars. But um, there is even on this map talking about gasoline and how, how the streetcar system saves everybody in, in the city on gasoline, um, how many employees they had what kind of parks that the streetcar was able to you know, support and buy and training of land like DeSoto, DeSoto Community Center. So um, this was just, a, I thought, a transition. And then, like I said, we move on from the streetcar to gasoline. And I just thought this was an interesting map. This was in the Tampa Bay Times, um, I want to say uh, 10 years ago or so. And somebody, as a cartographer, as a hobby, who's in my same field, would take those old maps and redraw them as if they were modern day uh, transit maps. So that's what it would look like today if the streetcars were still there, minus the interstates, notice that. But I also thought it was quite interesting, even though it's a modern day map, 
Davis Islands is still not there yet. Um, so that was a real great attention to detail for this cartographer at, who did this for a hobby. So it's really, again, great map. Now, these are our maps today, right? We have a lot of different styles when we map things today. And there are even this, the water taxis on this kind of map. And you've probably seen this map a lot. But I just thought it was interesting to see the rebirth, you know, the new line in red up there of our streetcar system. And then there's this map next to it that shows some options. They want to expand the system at one point. I'm not sure, you know, there's a plan in place, but there are plans to expand our streetcar system. And we should all be proud of this. It was just uh, rated as the most efficient in the United States. Um, so that's a great, you know, uh, thing to hang our head on. And here's another map, sort of, you know, of another concept of maybe uh, where or what might happen. Um, Union Station's right there in the middle. We're not a streetcar, but that's our train station. And you can see we have tracks going to St. Pete, and then even all, all the way down to Water Street, and even though some of those are gone now, um, this can be a you know, really fantastic multimodal, what we call it, uh, transportation system. Um, trains, streetcars, there's new uh, cars in downtown you can call, and they'll just come get you. So Tampa's doing a fantastic job with transportation. So I think I'm going to hand over the slides to my colleague for a uh, couple, and um, I hope you enjoy. I'll be back. Yes, thank you, Stephen, for that great introduction to this evolution of Tampa's streetcar system over the years. And so we've really partnered together to not only tell the longitudinal history of the streetcar system, but also to figure out ways that we might be able to digitally document and help preserve this system for future generations. As we'll see, there are some threats that the streetcars have already overcome, and there are some other threats that they may face in the future, and that goes for the system itself as well. So the Tampa and Ybor City Railway Society is a nonprofit organization that I wanted to really recognize at this moment for the amazing contributions that they've made to the restoration of some of the archival streetcars in the Tampa system. And so uh, there are three types of cars that currently um, the city of Tampa and Hart and Tico have, and that is the Bernie 163, the Breezer, and then the, Bre the Bernie Replica, which is the one that we're used to seeing traveling around our city of Tampa. So as we look at this slide here, we can see one of, a little bit about the story of what happened to the Bernie 163 after it was decommissioned. Um, and so you can see first, um, there it is on the left when it was in operation in the city. And then in the middle, you can actually see that it's been converted into a dwelling. And this is where a sort of a garage was built over it. And it was actually found by a very astute observer from this Tampa and Ybor City Railway Society who recognized it as a Bernie car. Um, lots of modifications had been made. There was all kinds of furniture inside of it and actually was a dwelling. And so they made a deal with the owner of this land that was up in Sulphur Springs to take that streetcar out of that shed and actually bring it back into the city and restore it. And they did a huge restoration. It's absolutely incredible work. And so we've been able to have a couple of really interesting conversations with some of the folks who have been behind that restoration, um, but really just an amazing example of community-focused heritage preservation. So you can see here a few photos of this restoration and what it was all about. So they refinished all of the woodwork and they brought back all of those original seats to their original condition. They did lots of research about the types of wood that was used and they were able to source all different parts of um, components of streetcars from various companies throughout the United States in an effort to really fully research these iconic and amazing archival streetcars and also bring them back. You can see they start rebuilding the wooden frame over there on the right. Um, really, really painstaking work. It took over 10,000 hours of effort to bring these streetcars back. And again, that was over 12 years of volunteer effort. And all the monies and materials to generate and create these restorations were basically just donated from the community. So again, a really iconic and amazing effort to preserve these amazing streetcars. Moving on, uh, just a couple of other photos here. Now, the Bernie 163 is a car that you don't see too often on the tracks, although if you're really lucky, you may have seen it. In fact, has anybody here ever seen it out in the city before? 
Okay, a handful of folks, yeah. So um, it comes out for special occasions, and one of those recent special, or somewhat recent special occasions was um, the 2001 Super Bowl festivities. Um, so you'll occasionally see it, and then that image on the right shows you the Bernie 163, and it's getting us ready to talk about our next streetcar, which behind it is the Breezer, my personal fave, one of my favorites. Um, so these are just the fully restored, amazing streetcars. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do this digital preservation and digital heritage project is that many of you have never had a chance to see some of these um, streetcars, which are kept in the car barn in Ybor City. Um, so they are not in regular daily use, and that is something that we wanted to be able to share with the public um, a little bit of the history and also just the beautiful craftsmanship that went into these streetcars that were so integral to Tampa's transportation system. So the Breezer streetcar is an absolutely beautiful work of craftsmanship. Uh, this is actually the first streetcar that was used in Tampa. Later on, uh, we transitioned to the Bernie. And so the Breezer, um, because its name, you know, is sort of very airy, and there's sort of a hop-on, hop-off aesthetic to it, and it's to its design. However, um, because of these open sides that enabled quick and easy access, you know, to and from the streetcar, it was also quite dangerous, as you can imagine. And so, um, on it was made. Uh, the decision was made to sort of take the Breezers out of use and then replace them with the much safer. Bernie Streetcar, which has complete size. And you can even see some of that early advertising that was built right into the design of those streetcars, telling people to be careful. So we're very happy about these safety innovations. And actually, that's something that really is part of the whole mission of Hart, who is managing the streetcars now. They're always focusing on safety. And in fact, the current Breezers, or I'm sorry, the current Bernies, which are replicas and expansions on the original Bernie 163 design, those ones definitely have additional safety features beyond what was available in the original streetcars. Okay. So uh, why do we want to scan the streetcars? Well, there are several good reasons to do this type of work, and this is really the core focus of what my lab is all about at the University of South Florida, and also why we care so much about engaging with the community and the public in furtherance of those goals. Um, so some of the threats that fa the streetcars face are from hurricanes and natural disasters. These are natural threats. And lots of other heritage sites also face threats from things like sea level rise. I didn't highlight that here because that's not one of the most pressing threats for Ybor City, which is at a relatively high elevation compared to some other parts of Tampa. Um, but the hurricanes and natural disasters really could damage the streetcars and the system. Um, we can see some examples of damage to the system back in the 1921 hurricane aftermath in the lower center there. That's when the tracks went down along Bayshore Boulevard. And you can see trees down, and the, the tracks were quite damaged from that event. And also, when we think about other cities that have streetcars, New Orleans comes to mind. And that's a streetcar where um, many of the cars had to be removed for up to a year for restoration and repair following the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. So this is something that could happen in our city. Of course, we hope it does not. But it's one of the main reasons and driving factors behind our interest in doing that digital scanning of these amazing, iconic streetcars. Another reason why it's important to scan these streetcars is because of anthropogenic or human-caused threats. So these are um, often talked of in, tr in terms of things like urbanization, industrialization, pollution, and armed conflict. So really global problems, and we'll get to a little bit of the global framework of these issues in a moment. Um, but here in Tampa, with these streetcars, I would say urbanization is one of the biggest threats that we see. Of course, we've seen the changes in the system over time, and that system and track is going to continue to change over time as our city grows in population, and we increasingly have developments like Channel Side and like Gas Works that are kind of squeezing that area in which the streetcars operate. Now, hopefully that'll be something that will increase ridership and in sort of make the streetcars an even more integral part of urban life here in Tampa, but also it's something that could lead to changes that might one day take it away. And so some of you may be familiar with some of the proposals to transform Tampa's streetcar system and swap out the Bernie replica cars that we currently see with these more modern, almost European-styled cars. Um, this may happen, it may not, I don't know. It's an idea that's kind of working its way through. 
the various stakeholders. Um, but as we can see from this quote here, it says, the preferred alternative for the project consists of replacement of the existing replicas with these modern vehicles. And so if we do that, um, you know, certainly we may lose a little bit of that place-based memory connected to these streetcars and these routes. And that's another reason why it's important to create these digital records and replicas so that we can appreciate now and in the future the amazing history of the streetcar system and its connection to the urban environments of Tampa. And so as we think about addressing these natural and anthropogenic threats, we also can tap into some of the global initiatives that have been put forth in order to further those goals, and that would be the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So again, in our work here um, at my lab, we're not only just doing this work because we think it's important, we're really linking it in with some of the best practices for the global digitization of cultural heritage. And so the target that we're sort of referencing and framing this work under is 11.4, which is to protect the world's natural and cultural heritage. So that really is a part of sustainability, thinking about preserving these uh, streetcars and the system not only for ourselves, but also for future generations. And of course, we have to address and contend with all of those different threats that it faces, that urbanization, as well as those large storms. So the goals of the project were to document the three iconic Hart streetcars, as well as three stations in Ybor City, create geospatial deliverables for Hart that can be integrated with ArcGIS for urban planning applications, creating an enduring 3D record of the streetcars, as well as their state of preservation. Of course, um, you know, they're in varying levels. Some of them, like the modern replicas, are out there day to day. We also need to document sort of how those are holding up for, in terms of maintenance. And then finally, a big part of it is that we want to deliver the 3D assets to Hart and Tico um, just so that they become stakeholders and they are fully aware of all the documentation and hopefully can put it to good use that serves the interests of their organizations as well. Um, so, uh, again, this is really core to all the types of work that my lab does. So just a moment to kind of briefly frame this in the context of many projects that we have going on here throughout the community. Uh, we're constantly going around and scanning sites um, both locally. Sorry. I thought this would play. Okay. Okay, uh, both locally here in Tampa, we've done sites like Union Station, Fort DeSoto, lots of work out at Egmont Key. Um, so it's really part of a broader initiative to not only document Tampa's amazing cultural heritage, but also train the next generation of heritage professionals and history professionals. And there are also some opportunities that some of you can get involved with, which we'll come back to a little bit at the end of the presentation. But the streetcars have been on our radar for a while just because we're always looking for those iconic pieces of Tampa heritage that we really want to make sure that we have a digital record of for future generations. And one of the great things about being set up as a lab is that we can do some of these scanning projects within the framework of training and workshop and professional development, which really keeps the cost down and then allows us to create a great product that we can turn over to our partners and our stakeholders in the city. So let's talk a little bit about the instrumentation that we used in furtherance of this goal to digitize these streetcars and the system. We're using LiDAR instrumentation. Has anybody heard of LiDAR before? Okay, great. Yeah, it's becoming more and more common when I ask that question. So LiDAR is an acronym. It stands for Light Detection and Ranging. And it is a technology that you'll find now in everything from an iPhone all the way up through a self-driving car. It's a really fast way to make a 3D measurement and record of the world around you from a sensor. And so the ones that we, sorry, the ones that we used here are called terrestrial LiDAR scanners. That just means they're on the ground on a tripod. And uh, we place them all around the objects that we want to scan. And we're always coming up with creative ways and innovative ways to make sure that we capture things like roofs and overhangs, um, because it's really up to the scan operator to figure out the best placement so that you get um, really beautiful coverage of the surfaces you're trying to scan. It's a little bit of an art as well as a science. And so at USF, we are fortunate enough to have six of these terrestrial LIDAR scanners. Each one of them can see about 1,000 feet in every direction from the placement of that tripod. Um, so you get amazing data quality with that type of range. And then also, 
Of course, you place the scanner a little closer to things you want a little more detail of. Something that's 1,000 feet away is not going to be quite as high res as something that's maybe you know, 5 or 10 feet away. Um, so yeah, our scanners are time of flight scanners, which basically means that they send out a laser beam and it goes through the air until it hits a surface, a solid surface, like the side of a streetcar. And then when it does that, a different laser beam goes back to the scanner, has a little bit of a different wavelength, and the scanner is able to calculate the position of that measurement in X, Y, Z based on the difference in the amount of time that it took for the beam to go out and come back. It sounds really complicated, but what's amazing about these scanners is it can do that about a million times per second. So these are very powerful instruments, and we get literally hundreds of millions of those 3D measurements of solid surfaces. So it's great for documenting things like buildings, architecture, and streetcars. Um, people always ask if it can see through surfaces. It cannot. And one of the limitations we'll talk about is that it also really doesn't like glassy or reflective surfaces either. And that's because it has a hard time sort of calculating where is that surface when it's a little bit shiny. So like I said, we're really fortunate to have a lot of this type of technology here at USF, and we love bringing it out into the community in order to document some of these amazing heritage sites that we have in Tampa. So we did some field work last year, it was last May and June, in a terrestrial LIDAR field methods course at USF. And here's a couple of our students that are crouching down here with two of our scanners, and they're placing them down low like that in order to get detailed scans of the uh, undercarriage of the streetcar as well as the wheels. And so the scanners can see um, the most accurately kind of like horizontally right across from them. And so that's why, you know, if we had them way up high on a tripod, we're not going to really get super good data of some of those lower portions of the streetcar. So that's something that we're definitely always um, teaching our students. Like I said, it's both an art and a science. So, you know, you have to kind of understand how the instrument works and also understand what are the points of interest and features of interest in the object or site that you're trying to scan. This right here we're looking at is the Breezer streetcar, and that is in the Hart car barn. And uh, we were fortunate enough to be granted access to that car burn after taking a very important safety training uh, with all of our students. And so again, we are very grateful to our partners at Heart for enabling us to get behind the scenes so that we can bring some of these products to you all and share them with you. So I wanted to just kind of take you on a little storytelling journey through the digital documentation of these streetcars before showing you the final product. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about just some of the challenges and successes that we faced during the course of the scanning project, which took a total of about two weeks. So first we have the Bernie 163. This is a small streetcar. Um, fun fact about the Bernie is that when they do take it out, it is the fastest streetcar. That's because it's very lightweight and it's very short. It's like about two-thirds of the length of the replica streetcars because it has no ADA or anything in there. And so it is a very fast streetcar, and uh, you have to be really careful when you're driving it because of some of those sharp turns on the system, or so the operators have told us. So some of the challenges that we faced when doing the scanning of uh, the streetcar were there are a lot of windows on it, and as I just mentioned, the scanner does not like anything that is shiny or reflective. And so we did the best that we could, and we'll show you a little bit of how we cleaned out some of the noisy data that we generated from those windows. Uh, but you know what? There's only so much you can do. One of the things that you'll see kind of over on the right is that we lifted up some of those windows to create open air spaces, and that reduced the noise. So that's one of the decisions that we made during the scanning process. Um, in addition, uh, there were different lighting conditions between the interior and the exterior. So, you know, anybody who's ever tried to take a picture um, that's maybe really brightly lit in the background or the foreground can understand how sometimes you don't get the best quality image in those types of settings. Same thing goes for 3D scanning. You know, we're colorizing all of our points with an internal camera. And so we had to take a lot of attention and care to sort of slowly transition our scanners from the dark interior into the very bright May and June exterior. Um, in this car barn, it's kind of like a garage, and so the door is the whole way up. The sun was beating in, and it was very glary outside. And so um, really just kind of thinking about the best way to develop those scans in order to kind of easily, smoothly transition interior to exterior. 
And then finally, we also had a lot of beautifully restored metal detailing on the benches and the windows we really wanted to capture. Um, and we did a good job of that, but every time that the scanner points at one of these you know, brass details, there is a little bit of sort of confusion on the part of the scanner. Where exactly is that surface? And so we'll get a little bit of noise around that area as well. Um, but I will say overall, it was just really a privilege and a great opportunity to even be able to be up close and personal with this amazing streetcar. And we'll show you the fly through here in just a minute. Moving on to the breezer. So the Breezer streetcar is much larger than the Bernie 163, and it has all that amazing woodwork, those vertical wooden poles on the sides, and a lot more seats than the Bernie has. And so one of the challenges that we faced with this one was really we needed so many scans to capture every angle of all the different pieces of that fine detail that would work. Also, even just looking up at the roof of it, I mean, there are so many different angles. And actually, when you take too many overlapping pictures with the scanner, it sometimes can introduce a little bit of error and sort of inaccuracy to your model. It's like if you capture it once perfectly, um, there's nothing to sort of overlap and kind of get a little bit off. Um, so that was a challenge for the breezer. But in the end, we just said, well, we're going to get all the scans from all the angles. And if it takes us a little bit longer to weave it all together in the lab, we'll do that. Um, so that was definitely a difficulty. You can see on the bottom left there, one of our students getting another one of those low shots. Again, making sure we have both the top as well as the underside of those steps to get in and out of the breezer. Another challenge that we faced is that we have to really make sure that we scan the roofs and the tops of all of these objects. As you'll see from the fly-throughs, it's absolutely critical in terms of storytelling as well as heritage <coughs> documentation to get that full comprehensive scan. And so there is an upper walkway at the Hart Station, but it doesn't go the whole way around the streetcar. So we had to sort of improvise. We had some ladders up there. I'm always kind of coming up with ways, um, as along with Stephen, to kind of like get those scanners high enough up to really get that roof. And you'll see um, the first shot, we actually missed it. So on the top right, you'll see that we kind of just couldn't really get that top overhang of the roof of the breezer. And that would be the far side kind of near the opening of the garage, just because there was no platform there where we could get the scanner kind of up above it. So what did we do? Well, our friend at heart, and I hope Subi's OK with me putting this picture on here, um, on the bottom right, he climbed up to the top of this ladder. And there was a ledge that was like the perfect location when the scanner was, or the car was moved to a different part of the car barn. We got that scanner up there. Subi was a great partner with us. So again, uh, we were able to capture that data on round two. You'll see that it is in the final model. And um, it's always just a little bit comes down to ingenuity and creative thinking with these scan projects. It's honestly a lot of fun. All right, moving on to car 436. So these are the ones that you'll see around town. Remember that number 436? You'll see it. I always say hi to it whenever I see it going around now. <laughs> um, and they're all, I think, I can't remember how many there are in the system, uh, but they, you know, cycle out with different types of graphics. And actually, one of the challenges that we had when scanning this streetcar um, had to do with those graphics. So as I mentioned, this is the largest streetcar. That's because they are, I believe, ADA accessible, and so they had to build a lot more room in them to make them quite longer. And also, they're a real transit option here in Tampa as well, so they wanted to increase the capacity of the streetcar. So because it's larger, it took us a little bit longer to scan over the course of two days. But what happened is that the streetcar was in its place in the car barn, and on day one, and then it left, and it went somewhere else, and on day two, it came back, and it was reversed which we found out the hard way. Um, so we scanned the whole thing. And you know these graphics are the same. They're like mirror images of one another. And we're, we couldn't figure out, like, why is the scan not lining up? Why isn't it coming together? And then we finally had this light bulb moment that on day two, it was actually flipped around. So once we digitally flipped the scan back around, everything worked out great. Um, so that definitely was one of the challenges that we faced with it. One of the good things about scanning this, though, is that that wrap graphic actually totally reduced the glare of the streetcar. It made it much easier to capture you know, the windows for obvious reasons. Um, but of course, then we got to the inside, and there were new glare problems. And those were the interior lights. 
Um, so it was helpful because it increased our ability to see all the woodworking and the details in those cars, which again are full replicas um, of the Bernie 163. They're inspired by that Bernie 163, so there's lots of great details in there. But they also added some kind of weird glare as well. So sometimes, you know, you can't have everything you want all at once. You just have to take what you can get and there were positives as well as negatives with that scanning environment. In the end, we did decide it was still better to have the lights on for the scan. And then also, we did some scans, like I said, three stations within Ybor City. So Centro Ybor uh, was definitely the most iconic and amazing place to scan that we did um, of the three stations we did, but also there were so many pedestrians moving around. And so, you know, as I mentioned, we are measuring the location of surfaces when we do these scan projects. And so when the surfaces are people that are moving around, well, that gets really, really noisy. And so you can see some of that noise on the left. We've got remnants of street cars up there. We've got people walking around, cars and buses going down the street. It all kind of looks messy. And we have the fun job at my lab at USF of going through and manually cleaning all of that stuff out. A couple words here about the process of kind of putting all this scan data together. Um, it does take several months. And um, in this case, it probably took us, I don't even know, three to four months, not full time, but kind of interwoven with some other projects that we had. We wish it was quicker, but also we're kind of happy that AI doesn't totally do it by themselves yet. So that's good. Um, in terms of the point cloud statistics for this project, we scanned three streetcars and three stations for a total of 1.4 billion measurements. So just imagine, uh, and that was about, I'd say, six or seven days of field work. Imagine how long it might take to make 1.7 billion measurements by hand of these streetcars or by hand of these stations. We would still be out there. Um, so even though it did take a little while to process that data, it's always good to kind of keep it in uh, a sort of a perspective. Um, this was 70 gigs of raw data and 523 gigs of process data. So that's why we have lots of supercomputers up at my lab in order to handle those types of data sets. Uh, a little bit about that data processing. So as I mentioned, it still is a manual process to clean out all of these scans. This is raw data of the inside of the Bernie 163, or actually the 463 on the left, and that's the clean data on the right. So a little shout out here to my research assistant, Alex, who did all of this painstaking work over the course of several months, really just making sure that our finished product looks nice and clean and pretty. Another thing that we look at when we're developing these digital products is our registration report. This is a sort of a, a number that encapsulates the overall quality and accuracy of the data. And 2.7 millimeters is absolutely amazing. What that means is that that's the overall accuracy of every measurement um, of the entire streetcar or the whole Centro Ebor is accurate down to a difference of about 2.7 millimeters. Um, when you compare that with some of the results from things like aerial LIDAR or even mobile, it's much more fine-grained. And so that's why this is very, very useful in contexts like historic preservation. Um, and so here's a, a little bit of a snapshot, some 2D screen captures of what the final products looked like. So here's the breezer. We have also over on the right an overview map and an orthophoto. What those are are geometrically corrected images, and these are the kind of things that we can share with a conservator or an architect or engineer. This is the kind of work we've done at Union Station, working with the architect there who's doing the restoration and renovation of the windows. See, once you have these 3D scans, not only do you have great visualizations of every single millimeter of the entire structure inside and out, you have the ability at the click of a button to now start drawing out 2D maps and top-down maps and elevations, profiles, plans, you name it, that can really be put into practice in order to promote the preservation and conservation of these structures for the future. Um, so again, it's not only a tool for digital storytelling, it's also a tool for that continued conservation and preservation. Um, here's some images again of the Streetcar 436. In this one model alone, we have 135 million measurements. So really incredible, um, the full interior and the full exterior is totally documented here. And then of course, here's our friend, the Bernie 163, oops. 
3163 as well, we can see um, in this little encapsulation here. Once we have those uh, 3D models all done, oops, we can also do things like colorize it according to X values or Z values. Um, so again, really interesting ways to just look at these details. And of course, it's a little more exciting when you're actually in there in the computer in 3D, but these are just some screen captures of those sort of images that you can derive from the 3D model. And then finally, um, here is what the finished Centro Ebor looks like. So now we're able to take these orthophotos, those geometrically corrected images of entire neighborhoods within the city. So imagine, you know, if you wanted to renovate a facade, for example, or like really get into the details here of maybe the streetcar tracks, which are also on here, you can really start measuring these. And this becomes a really useful tool for things like urban planning. So we can now think about incorporating historic streetscapes into the future of urban planning into GIS and things like that, which is a really exciting thing because, of course, we want to, history to be part of the future of Tampa, and planning is, of course, how those decisions get made. Um, again, some really interesting images of the Centro Ebor, um, just colorized by these X, Y, and Z values, highlighting different aspects of um, the architecture and built environment in that area. Okay. Video. Okay, here we go. So here is a fly-through video that's just gonna sort of highlight some of the streetcars for you. So again, these are like the 3D, 3D models that we made. First up, we have the Bernie. Um, so again, looking at all those details and we captured the full exterior, every single millimeter of the whole thing, the full interior as well. Um, we didn't get fully underneath the streetcars. I think maybe in a future project we will. There's actually a maintenance part of the car barn where people actually do go fully under them to work on it. And we didn't get down there this time. So we have kind of the outside edge of all of the undercarriage of the streetcar. We don't have the complete underside. But again, we were also limited on time. And our field crew was consisting of USF students who also had only a few days out there uh, with the streetcars. Um, so again, this is not the full 3D model. It's really just kind of a visualization of some of the data. But just imagine that every single millimeter of it can be you know, sliced and drawn. So for example, we could you know, make drawings of each of the benches or all of the metal work or all of the woodwork, for example. Same can also be said for the Breezer streetcar that we're seeing here. Uh, so we went through, like I said, lots of painstaking work to get those upper parts of the roof of the streetcar and all those details. And you can see also the woodwork, um, those red painted areas coming out really nicely as well because they're a little bit less reflective than some parts of the Bernie. Um, we also did have to, there's a lot of con sort of conductor details up front that we made sure that we got. And um, as I mentioned, my research assistant, Alex, did a wonderful job doing some of the cleaning on the interior here as well. Let's see what's next. Oh, here comes the outside. Um, one of the things that we definitely had to do manually was we scanned this so many times with so many different scan positions, one in each row of seating, that we had to just make sure there wasn't too much overlap. And so we kind of sliced away a few um, kind of overlapping parts. And then you can see a little bit less noise happening on the uh, streetcar 436, the modern replica, again, because there's a little bit less reflectivity to this streetcar than some of the other two that we've already seen. And so, like I said, if you see this one around town, say hi to it. And um, yeah, it, it's like I said, it's really um, an art and a science to figure out how to get these type of projects done in the span of maybe five or six days. How do you plan enough scan positions to make sure you capture all the detail and have, let's say, an even amount of measurements from the front of the streetcar as the back, from the inside as the outside. Um, so that's something we're really excited to be able to have an opportunity to engage with um, here as sort of a, you know, with our students as well as with members of the public. And I'm going to let Stephen say a couple words about the stations now. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, so we work as a team. Uh, I couldn't be more grateful for her. And what we did for this course is we would split students up because it, I think there was a limit of only having three or four students in the car barn at a time because of the dangerous conditions. So that's where we get, get, got the idea to let's go scan the stations as well. 
Um, and you know, I said earlier, I started make, making maps with pencils on the great desk job, computer, no problem. And then next thing I know, I'm dodging cars in the middle of the road and you know, climbing walls and figuring out that you know, the side of Potomac River is really slippery when you're carrying a $100,000 piece of equipment. You know, just things I was like, what did I get myself into? But for my students, that was their part while they were here. They got to do the, the streetcars and the city. Now, uh, Dr. Harrison talked about having to put scanners all around. Well, obviously, we can't put them in the streets. So we would want to get angles of things, but we're not stopping traffic in Ebor for two weeks. Chickens are everywhere, <laughs> right? Our famous chickens get in the way. This scan here, for example, we were in the field. Everything was going fantastic and about 200 kids spilled out of game time on their school trip. Just hitting tripods, everything. We, all, right, all right, let's start over. We picked everything up, put everything back, and it started raining. So now, all right, we lost an entire day, but I try to teach the students, like, this is what field mapping is all about. And so uh, each one of these stations had a different um, obstacle in, in our way. You know, even, we were even scanning from uh, Alex's truck I was like, just pull it up, pull it up, pull it right up, and we put the tripod on top of the roof. So that's part of like the course that we've developed. Um, not only do you learn these highly technical, detailed um, methods, you also learn you know, how to do field work, and you never know what the challenges may be. One of my students, when we were doing Union Station, was scared of heights. And he's like, yep, this is part of you know, doing a field method course, because you had to climb up the access roof. There's no other way up to get onto the roof of uh, Union Station. So every station pose, I mean, every project poses a different problem. And so even, even for us, every summer we have to, what we do is uh, called a scan plan, is how are we going to attack this building with our lasers, right? Wh where are we going to go? Who, what access can we have? And, and the people at Tico were fantastic, and every other site that we've worked at, oh, I didn't do that. Uh, was that supposed to? To happen. So, <clears throat> let me go back one. Uh oh, we went back. Uh oh. All right, I'm gonna just go next. Yep. I shouldn't be trusted with this. All right. <clears throat> so, we uh, those are the fly-through videos, and there's some QR codes if you want to take pictures of your phone. They actually have each video on YouTube, uh, and you'll find uh, many other of our videos there. And. Uh, I think we'll be having more up uh, soon, and I'll leave that up there just for a second so you can take out your phone. Um, but one of our goals, let me check the next slide. Okay, great. Um, I'll go to the next, the next one because this is, these are the stations. And so w when we started developing these course years ago, I w it was like, you know, I don't know if anybody else in America even has a college course like this. And we found out we are the only one in the nation that actually teaches these things in a college course setting. It's a graduate course. Um, but we have to figure out ways to maybe, we may not have to do training, uh, like the students had to do safety training. And one of our main goals are, is, you know, if we're going to do this, we can scan this. This is a very you know, expensive for the city to do that. Um, so why not find you know, endangered sites uh, that are historic, that could be preserved forever. So what I'm trying to build, I, I'm, a, I'm totally envious of the History Center and their map uh, center upstairs, but uh, together with Dr. Harrison, we're trying to digitize as much as Tampa as I can. I'm trying. There we go. And so what, what we're doing is, now these images you're about to see are not as impressive as the ones we make with the uh, map. But we take these scans and actually do put them in a 3D map. And we're building this slowly. It's one of a, one of a kind in the nation. We're actually breaking the software. The software company is using us as examples um, on how to do things. And what you'll see, and I'm going to start zooming around, but on the right, you can pick um, one of the sites or one of the uh, buildings, or you'll see in a second. I don't want to ruin it other things we've scanned. And um, this map is interactive, and we're slowly going to be adding scans as we do the classes. And you can go there, and like I said, they're not going to be as impressive, because I had to reduce this to 50,000 points from the original 4 billion. But that's what we're working on with the software company, is 
how can we make this better? But that's Union Station on a 3D map, just like you would look at Google Maps. And um, you can zoom around this and see our other scans across the city. So over time at USF, just keep digitizing and scanning our iconic, uh, iconic buildings. Um, we even have a new scanner now where we can drive down the street and get maybe, let's say, Franklin, uh, Franklin Street. But one of our most challenging ones was we scanned a ship. It had to be dry docked. There's very, very tight spots. Um, I did not want to get underneath that boat. It's a couple of hundred tons. But <laughs> in order to scan that, that's what we had to do. And so this was a very challenging one. But again, we're able to take these scans and put like that gray area there is actually the channel, uh, the water, and um, make this 3D environment. And this is um, DeSoto Community Center. You know. Um, this is the one that the company actually used in an ad. And I was like, that, I'm, that's great, we're flattered, but I, we, need, we need to fix this point cloud a little bit. Because this is online, so we can't move billions of points, right? So we have to select and filter a bunch out. But um, the next uh, one here, we're working on getting them in there. But this is the Casitas by Centennial Park in Ybor City. And the bunker in the middle there. Uh, this one was a little bit more difficult because it is Hillsborough County property and there were businesses going on, right? So coffee shop was open at the time and uh, it was just, this one was very challenging. We rented a U-Haul, the biggest U-Haul we can find to use as almost a stage to put the tripods on. And we just moved the U-Haul down the street to scan down because we weren't allowed to step on the buildings because it's next to the sheriff's office. So with this map, you can see I'm changing different maps, road maps, things like that. And things that my students learn also is how to just make 3D models. So that's Lee's Grocery in Tampa Heights that was converted to a uh, uh, pizzeria. And then the neighboring home. And then at the time, that building to the left was not built yet. So you can go and click on that pop-up that I just had. And this is the future of all of our scans. And then go to YouTube and see the more high-definition uh, quality images. That's a drone video uh, flying over Lee's Grocery. That's what we call the as-built. You can see the kegs in the back and the stools. And uh, my, my students learn how to make these 3D environments uh, along with the help with Dr. Harrison and can visualize what, what, may, <clears throat> what may be built uh, in, in further plans. So you can see there's even telephone poles in here that they make and they put some cars in there. But this is this right there is a student product. And then future development. And some of these models are becoming standard, like the city of St. Pete, where you have to give them this data if you want to develop something. And so there's Lee's Grocery. Yep, they were gracious enough to just let us come there. Um, they were closed on, I think, what, Mondays and Tuesdays? And so uh, this one had some challenges, too, but it was a much smaller building. And um, one of the harder parts is all these leaves would blow around. Every day, somebody would move an umbrella. Again, that's those things we have to deal with. But where this is and how it is in the map, this is a survey grade 3D map. Like uh, Dr. Harrison said earlier, we have billions of measurements, but this is what's called geo-referenced. So it's not just a scan or a photograph. It's actually in, in the place it should be on the map. And it's just some you know, awesome things we can do. This is called ghost view, I think, where you basically fade out the image so you can see through the building. Um, and you can see us flying around that in, uh, in the map in 3D. So um, many students helped on all these awesome projects. And uh, this was just me with the drone one day after I took that video. I thought this looked really cool. So I th thought we'd end that video with that. And um, yeah, we've had now probably 80 students help out with these projects. And they're getting all this experience. And then we're moving on, like I said, to mobile, which is going to be, again, the, the first class of like it is in the nation. Of its, uh, like, like uh, sorry, first class like it in the nation. So um, just, just more great things to come. I mean, uh oh, told you you can't trust me with this. Do I have the ne next? OK, okay there. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to go back and forth because we specialize in different things. So I'm going to give it back to Dr. Harrison there. Yeah, so 
Um, of course, everything that Stephen just said is some of our past work, and the streetcars are kind of like a current and evolving project. And so that is the future of the streetcars, is putting them also onto that web map, which you'll also be able to view in the comfort of your own home by just navigating to a web address and kind of navigate around, spin around, and interact with that streetcar. So, you know, we already showed you some of those video fly-throughs of the streetcars and the stations. Um, that web map is really the next step beyond that because it provides an opportunity for you to actually interact with that. You can spin it around with your own mouse, zoom in, zoom out, and learn more. So again, that's kind of our vision of one of the next steps for the streetcar project. Um, another potential one, and this is a little bit of blue sky thinking here, but is the idea of doing some kind of digital exhibit about the streetcars. So uh, maybe a public exhibit, maybe we could you know, put an actual streetcar like one of the archival ones in type of an exhibit space, and then do something like augmented reality where we add some little digital hotspots that you point your phone at, and you can see it come to life and hear some of the more historical stories about the amazing streetcars. Of course, um, you know, and places in the community that really have done extensive research on the streetcars, like that Tampa and Ybor City Railway Society, like the Tampa Bay History Center, would be instrumental in that type of an effort to really kind of delve into some of those um, stories that are connected with the many different eras of streetcar history here in Tampa. So just an idea of where we're kind of going in the future. This is a project that's actually kind of still in its infancy. Um, for us at the lab and at USF, just getting the scan data is definitely not the end goal. That is really just the beginning that we start and build from. And so we are very committed to things like public engagement and preservation into the future. Um, just kind of wrapping up with a couple of sort of key themes and overarching themes of the project as we look forward. Um, you know, why did we do all this work? Um, one of the reasons is for digital heritage for maintenance and decision making. So I'm sure many of you have probably heard of the tragedy of the fire at Notre Dame and how they're now going through and rebuilding that. Well, the plans that they're using to do that reconstruction of Notre Dame Cathedral are from terrestrial LIDAR, the same thing that we use to scan all the streetcars and stations, as well as all Union Station and the boat and everything else. So this is kind of like the industry standard for creating those as-built plans of architectural heritage. And that is something that, of course, we do hope that nothing bad happens to the streetcars and they continue to go throughout our city and um, they are not taken away and replaced with something else. But if it does happen, we do have these scans. And also, if a storm comes through, we will be able to reference those scans to do rebuilding. Um, in addition, Hart was really excited when they saw that you could, with the click of a button, make a measurement of the tracks. So when we have our, you know, we turned our 3D scan data over to them, and we kind of walked them through everything. They were so amazed um, because a lot of the times, one of the big challenges that they have is that these tracks sort of shift and dip over time, right? Just like how potholes get created and they sort of change the topography of a road. Um, that same thing happens to these streetcar tracks and then it can cause a train to get derailed and cause accidents and all kinds of problems downstream. So it takes them a lot of time and staff to actually just send somebody out to do all this monitoring. Um, and what we've been able to do with the digital scans is actually create a new tool for maintenance and decision making that they can incorporate and do initial measurements right from, and again, down to millimeter level accuracy right in the comfort of their own offices. So again, this is in many ways the future of urban planning as well as the management of an urban transit system. In addition, uh, the, uh, the 3D scans create an enduring record of iconic transportation technology. And so um, just like archival maps, these become sort of these 3D versions that will live on in perpetuity. And we have these, we've turned them over to our community stakeholders um, in an effort to basically contribute to the archive that we do have about these iconic streetcars in the future. So we have an exact state of preservation of what they were like and what state of condition they were in in May and June 2023. We can then go back and update that as sort of a digitally driven archival technology that's helping us do the best that we can to, again, advance that SDG 11.4 protect the world's natural and cultural heritage. 
And so just wrapping up, um, as I mentioned, we do have some upcoming projects at the lab. And so some of them are open to the public. So if this is something that you want to learn a little bit more about, come out into the field uh, with my team and I and actually get some hands-on scanners and get out there and do some, some 3D digital heritage work. We do have a workshop coming up at the end of the month um, into May. So it's seven days from April 29th to May 7th. We're going to be down at Fort DeSoto doing some scans of the military architecture down there. Um, if you're interested, we have some flyers in the back, and I'll also be around if you have questions. And also, um, for anybody who may be a USF student listening in or in the audience, we also have a course coming up this summer in terrestrial LIDAR field methods, and um, we're really excited about that. We're going to be scanning the Port Tampa City Library, which is a beautiful little iconic architectural gem down in Port Tampa. So those are a couple of the projects that we have coming up here uh, in the next couple of months. And with that, I would like to, again, thank the Tampa Bay History Center for the opportunity to share this project with you and turn it over to questions and comments.